So it was time to say bye 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 to the year 2000 and the fantastic gaming year that it was and move into 2001. When we left 2000, it was Sony with its PlayStation 2 that was emerging as the behemoth of the home console world, leaving other companies searching for answers and a way to compete. And it wouldn't be very long at all after the new year that competition would present itself. So if you want to go and take a ride with me, grab your favorite Abercrombie and Fitch tea, maybe even bring along your friends from Bandcamp, and let's jump into a look back at gaming in 2001. Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to Goldcoin Mountain. We're essentially on part two of this series where I'm going through the years of the century and taking a look back at the games and systems that are near and dear to my heart and so many others. I'm sorry this video took so long to get out. I've just had some life stuff get in the way, but I'm happy to be putting it out there now. If you like what I'm doing here, please consider subscribing. Also, like, share, comment, all that fun stuff as it does help me get seen by more people. But without farther delay, let's jump right into 2001. A quick disclaimer, just like the year 2000 video, all releases mentioned are the North American release because that's where I'm from. So if something released in Japan the year earlier, don't yell at me. Or do, just make sure you do it down in the comments for engagement. Also, even though I might have a reference or two to handheld games, this whole series mostly focuses on console gaming. Sorry, Tweety and the Magic Gems. It would be slightly just after the ball drop signifying the jump into the new year that Bill Gates and The Rock would take the stage at CES, revealing the Xbox to the world. Leading to The Rock making this statement in a fun back and forth on the stage. Never cease to amaze The Rock, you're right again. Today isn't about you, it's about the new Xbox. And quite frankly, I couldn't be more excited. The Xbox is everything The Rock is, cutting edge, powerful, exhilarating, and like The Rock, it will be the most electrifying thing coming out this year. But was he right? Microsoft had an uphill battle with Sony as the current king, and Nintendo, the most recognizable name in gaming, both with a leg up on the newcomer. And technically at the time of that announcement, Sega's Dreamcast was still a competitor in the console space. Sega decided to cut its losses and announced on January 31st that it would be discontinuing the Dreamcast and instead becoming a third-party software developer, which meant they would be making games for their former competition, but they would still have some releases coming to the Dreamcast instead of just killing it right then and there. And one of those releases was just two days before said announcement with Phantasy Star Online. It was an RPG developed by Sonic Team that was the first online RPG for consoles. Players created a character and assumed the role of adventurers, which could gather, buy and sell items, explore open areas, and fight enemies cooperatively with other players over the internet. At the time, it was pretty much unheard of for non-PC players and was reviewed exceptionally well, even being called one of the most important games in console gaming evolution by VentureBeat. The following week would be Nintendo releasing an offline RPG on the N64, proving that they weren't quite ready to just coast until their next console when they released Paper Mario. The game was originally being developed as Super Mario RPG 2, but when Square and Nintendo had a falling out, the game was handed over to Intelligent Systems. It incorporated a lot of well-known Mario mechanics with classic RPG turn-based combat, using Mario's signature jump on the head or the new giant wooden hammer to decimate his foes. Critics and players alike applauded the visuals, the world to explore, the humor, and the puzzles. And I would love to confirm those things for you. However, come closer. I've never played it. But leaving it off a list about gaming in 2001 was not something I was prepared to do. Maybe someday I'll make a dent in my backlog from hell and I'll experience it firsthand. Exactly a month later, on March 5th, Nintendo and Rare would release Conker's Bad Fur Day on the N64, throwing a curveball into the perspective that Nintendo was only for kids. Conker is a squirrel who gets shit-faced at a bar one night, pisses off his girlfriend, and passes out. I mean, we've all been there. When he wakes up, he starts his adventures through levels of characters getting torn apart, blood spray, sex references, hilarious and vulgar name calling, and all kinds of other things that made it hilarious for a mid-teen to play back in those days. I remember thinking that no one would probably make a game like this ever again. And boy was I in for a surprise later this year. Later on in the month of March, the top song in the country at the time was Survivor by Destiny's Child, and it was clear Sega and the Dreamcast were the exact opposite of what Beyonce was singing about. As Sega would officially stop production of the Dreamcast as they announced earlier, ending only a year and a half run on the market. The good news for gamers was that in order to sell off inventory, the price was cut to $99. Eventually it would fall to $79 and then to $49, but it would end its run selling only 9 million units in its short lifespan. Even though the N64 was supposed to be slowing down, on April 8th, Dr. Mario 64 was released for the console. A Tetris-like game that featured falling capsules instead of blocks, you had to match up at least four colors in order to get them to be removed from the screen. 
And then, a month later, on May 7th, the third entry into the Mario Party series debuted. These games would turn out to be the last Nintendo-developed games on the system, and signaled the end of an era for the company's first 3D console. The rest of the month of May was light on releases across all platforms, but at the box office this all-time classic was shown off to the world, setting a new bar for animation and voice acting. Oh, this is gonna be fun! We can stay up late, swapping manly stories, and in the morning, I'm making waffles. By mid-June, it became the top-grossing movie of 2001, an accomplishment that would be surpassed later in the year, but was without a doubt a huge alternative option to what seemed like a drought in game releases. And speaking of droughts in mid-June, the PS2, which seemingly had releases very few and far between for the first half of the year, would bring out the fantastic Twisted Metal Black on June 18th. The tone would be set right from the dark opening video where Paint It Black by the Rolling Stones blared from the speakers, which I won't play here because I don't want a copyright strike or Mick Jagger to sleep with my wife. This game was fantastic and would come to define nights with me and my friends back then. And as I mentioned, the darker tone in this entry was the main change from the first two games on PS1. The story mode features different characters all with their own dark backstory, like Mr. Grimm who's a veteran of Vietnam and was forced to eat his dead friend to survive and now wears that friend's skull as a helmet. Well, that's kind of f***ed up. Or how about the kid who can control his dead dad with a gaming controller? Super weird and super dark, but learning about the crazy backstories of all these characters was quite engaging. And then of course there's a multiplayer full of vehicle destruction, explosions, fun weapons, and all the crazy looking rides that a teenager that was soon to get his license could want. It couldn't have been more perfect that this game was released in June when we were all on summer break, and after getting a case of the newly released Code Red Mountain Dew, we could stay up for hours enjoying the destruction in this game, yelling at each other in a small room, and accusing everyone of cheating. That may not sound like a great time, but just ask your kids who are doing the exact same thing on Fortnite right now. But anyway, it's a memory that will always stick with me, and it's always fun to think back on. Remember when I said just because the Dreamcast wasn't in production anymore didn't mean that they were done with games? Well, just the following day, on June 19th, Sonic Adventure 2 would hit store shelves. It would later come to the GameCube and was generally favorable among Sonic fans, with most considering it an adequate follow-up to Sonic's first dip into 3D gaming. The next couple months would be slow for releases, and when I say that, I'm sure someone watching enjoys one or more of these games, but for me, it wouldn't be until late August when Madden 2002 would come out that I had another game that I could sink hours into. I know I covered Madden in the 2000 video, so I'll just say here that it was a nice improvement from the prior year. Going forward, who could forget Portal Runner, Arctic Thunder, and Bash Strike all on the PS2? I'll tell you who, apparently everyone, as none of those games even threatened to get out of the 50s on Metacritic. At least Silent Hill 2 was there for people, if you were into survival horror. But just a month after that, it was time to lose myself in a game for hours upon hours. In fact, I wish consoles kept track of gameplay time back then because mine would have been insane. Yes, it was time to steal cars, pick up hookers, and beat the piss out of pedestrians in GTA 3. After the first two games in the series on the PS1 were of the top-down perspective, the third entry went to a third-person view, released on October 22nd, and I think it's fair to say that it revolutionized the open-world sandbox genre. Its open world could be navigated on foot or in a vehicle, but let's be real here, it was too fun to yank drivers out of their car and ride off with it, so no one was going on foot. The story of the game centers around Claude, a small-time criminal at the beginning, who was shot by his girlfriend during a robbery. That's one way to break up. And ends up going to prison. However, he's able to escape during his transfer and befriended by another convict in the process. From there, Claude gets introduced to the Mafia and his meteoric rise to the top of the criminal underworld is put into motion. In between story missions, there's optional side missions, but if you were like me back then, a ton of your time while not concentrating on the story was spent just messing around in the streets, seeing how many stars you could get on your wanted level, filling it up and prompting the army to send a tank after you. Looking up cheats on your dial-up internet to use in-game, flying cars, full health and armor, all weapons, or just spawn one of the aforementioned tanks for your personal use. I remember I had never seen anything like it, and I was absolutely blown away. Even just driving around the city and listening to the radio in a car was incredible at the time, especially with the commercials that aired in between songs that usually had me dying laughing at the randomness. Would you like a giraffe? Have one delivered. Just log on to PetsOvernight.com and we'll send you a giraffe overnight. What's also funny is thinking back now, I'm almost positive I only ever rented this from Blockbuster or borrowed it from a friend because there isn't a chance in hell my mom would have been okay with me playing it. But that's why you close and lock your door so they don't know what you're playing in there. Also good advice for other things you could be doing in there. 
For me, this game is so important to my life in gaming because it just really blew me away that a game could have this much detail and stuff to do in it. In a way, it showed me what the future of games could be and how a world could be created and alive. And it's something I'll never forget and always point to as a huge gaming moment for me personally, and I'm thankful I got to experience it. Less than a week after that, it was no longer Bill Gates and The Rock just talking about and showing off the Xbox, it was time to bring it to store shelves and put it in the hands of gamers on November 15th. All eyes were on Microsoft here as this was the first major console release by an American company since the Atari Jaguar in 1993. And if anyone could come in with a giant financial backing and innovation to match and immediately compete with the big two, it was Microsoft. The company already had its hand in software for a long time, and even had collaborated with Sega on the Dreamcast by allowing developers to use the Windows CE operating system to create games for that console. But now it was time for their very own hardware, and it was the power of the new hardware that showed everyone that they were here to stay. Even in a lot of the marketing material, you could see the point that they wanted to drive home was what it could do that the PS2 could not. It had an ethernet port built in for online gaming, an internal hard drive instead of memory cards, and internals for higher resolution games that made it the best looking console on the market. It also had a DVD player, like the PS2, although you had to buy a remote separately to use this feature. The lineup of games on release day shown here wasn't exactly mind blowing. However, one stands above the rest, and of course, that game is Halo Combat Evolved. The tremendous futuristic first person shooter that had a lengthy single player campaign, and also the ability to do split screen and multiplayer via LAN. This was the first time the world was introduced to Master Chief and the exceptional weapons that Halo would come to be known for. It would tie GTA 3 and Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 for the highest rated game on Metacritic for the year. No easy feat for a year that was seemingly throwing out bangers left and right. The game hit the 1 million mark in sales five months after release and had an attach rate of over 50% to all Xbox consoles sold. It remains a fan favorite today and deserves credit for what it did for the FPS genre. As for the Xbox itself, it would sell 1 million units in its first three weeks and would hit 1.5 million by the end of the year. A very successful launch, and now we knew to take Microsoft seriously in the console gaming market. And it was literally just three days later that another mainstay in the console gaming market was ready to bring their future console to North America. And I thought instead of me, there is no one else better to tell you about that than my friend Marcello over at GameCube Galaxy. So without further delay, let me send it over to my special guest. Hey everyone, Marcello here from GameCube Galaxy and my good buddy Matt over at Goldcoin Mountain reached out to me asking if I could discuss some aspects about a particular console that released in November of 2001 here in North America, that being the Nintendo GameCube. The Nintendo GameCube was a console that I was extremely excited about coming from the N64, which I absolutely loved. Seeing what the GameCube had coming out at launch and seeing its graphical prowess for me was second to none. And when you look at the GameCube, the GameCube was the underdog of the 6th gen. The PlayStation 2 had already been out for one year and had cemented its place in the 6th gen, and Microsoft was just days apart from basically releasing their console, the Xbox. However, Nintendo's console for me was one that I hold near and dear to me because it was honestly the first home console that I received that was actually mine that I got on Christmas of 2001. And while the console had 21 launch day titles, as well as various other titles that released within a few week period between then and holiday season, there were five games I got on Christmas of 01 that stood out for me with my console, which were Luigi's Mansion, NHL Hits 2002, Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2 Rogue Leader, Wave Race Blue Storm, and of course, the number one selling game on the GameCube, Super Smash Bros. Melee. Now, this was a Christmas I will never forget because it was the Christmas where I basically spent the entire break exploring this extremely exciting console for Nintendo. And looking back at this particular holiday season, this particular year that really changed the course of Nintendo, the GameCube for me just stood out as a console that was just visually stunning. It was light years ahead of what the PS2 could do realistically when you look at games like Resident Evil Remake and Star Wars Rogue Leader. And what really stood out for me about the GameCube was that its launch for me is second to none. There was no other console for me that had launch titles as varied and as well put together to showcase the console's prowess than the GameCube. When you look at something like Star Wars Rogue Leader, which was a day one launch title in North America, and over 20 years later, that game still looks absolutely phenomenal. 
as well as something like Luigi's Mansion, which was light years ahead of what the N64 could do, that was at a time when console gaming was at its most exciting. That was at a time when console gaming truly showed what a next-gen leap could look visually versus nowadays consoles that are just kind of half steps up. And when you look at the GameCube, yes, I know a lot of people say it was a failure back in the 6th gen, and in many ways it was in terms of sales. In terms of exclusives though, the GameCube absolutely had bangers for the console. Games like the ones I mentioned, as well as Resident Evil Remake and Resident Evil 4, which was exclusive at least for a few months before it got the sloppy PS2 port, as well as games like F-Zero GX, 1080 Avalanche, Super Mario Sunshine, Custom Robo, Wario World, Eternal Darkness, games like this that were just absolutely awesome experiences. And what I like to look back at upon the GameCube for Nintendo, especially as a company, was it was the first time they ever published an M-rated game being Eternal Darkness, and then years later, their second published M-rated game being Geist. And honestly, seeing Nintendo publish M-rated games on their own was kind of a big deal. And sure, nowadays with the Switch, they've published games like Bayonetta, which are M-rated games, but again, if you look back at the gaming climate back in 2001 to 2007, it was kind of a big deal to see Nintendo take that leap forward. They were trying to grow with their audience that came from the N64, that came from the SNES, and tried to make these more teen-like slash mature-like experiences to win over that market. Unfortunately, without any DVD player attached to the console, it was kind of a less enticing proposition for consumers to put the money down on the GameCube, despite the fact that its price point was very attractive. That being said, the GameCube for me is a console that always stood the test of time. I will say, while the GameCube never reached the heights of what it should have, it did garner far more popularity within the last five years. So yeah, that's just kind of a quick recap thick in the back at 2001 and getting the GameCube and why I will still stand tall on the fact that that was my favorite 6th gen console of that generation. And I'm glad to see that in the recent years, that popularity starting to surge. Curious, what were your favorite GameCube games at launch? Anyway, Matt, thank you for having me take part in this collab about the 2001 year of gaming. Now, back to you. Thank you so much to Marcello for joining me and adding some of his thoughts on the GameCube and some of its games. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to his channel as he puts out fantastic content every time he uploads. The rest of the year would see some releases, but nothing like we saw and covered earlier leading up to this point. Naughty Dog would bring out its fantastic new IP with Jack and Daxter as the company was well on its way to becoming one of Sony's powerhouse developers with its 3D platformer. And it also wasn't too far down the road that we'd start to recognize them as gaming storytelling royalty. That's called foreshadowing. So as we start to close the book on the fantastic year that was gaming in 2001, we would turn our attention to 2002. And if you think the fire releases were about to stop, just know that it was still very hot in here. And there are some incredible experiences and memories that need to be talked about. And the next video coming up in the series is how I'll remind you. A huge thank you again to Marcello over at GameCube Galaxy for joining me on this. But with that, I think I've said pretty much all I need to say about 2001. We will return for 2002. Other than that, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.